from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me to the 20th chapter of the book of John. The 20th chapter of the book of John, beginning with the 24th verse. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, you've believed. But blessed are they, blessed are they in 1977, blessed are they, that have not seen. They've not been able to touch my body. They've not been able to see the nail prints in my hand. They have not been able to see the place where I was pierced by the spear. But they believe anyway. There's a special blessing and a special reward for them because they have to come by sheer faith. You have seen and felt and touched as well as believed. That has a message for us, but I don't want to go into that whole dialogue because time is very short, and I don't want to be very long tonight. I want to take one little phrase out of that and use it tonight, the hands of Jesus. The 20th chapter and the 27th verse, Behold my hands. Behold my hands. Do you know how many times the word hands are used in the Bible, or the word hand is used in the Bible? 1,433 times. Now look at your hands. Take them out in front of you and look at them a moment. It's the most versatile part of all your body. We climb with our hands. We push with our hands. We pull with our hands. We throw with our hands. We catch with our hands. We can tear with our hands. We can thread with our hands. We can sew with our hands. We can chisel with our hands. We can sew with our hands. We can drive a nail with our hands. We can draw a picture on a canvas with our hands. We can play an instrument with our hands as we heard these men from Ireland a moment ago. We can even walk on our hands, as I've seen some do. And of all the five senses, the eagle can see better, the dog can smell better, and the horses can sense better and hear better with their ears. But none of the animals have the hands that are capable of such diversification as the human hands. Think of everyday usage that we make of hands. If you want assistance, you say, lend me a hand. If you want experience, you say, I'm an old hand at that. If you want to express a wasted life, you say, well, he's empty-handed. If you want somebody who's greatly involved, you say, well, he's got his hands full. He can't do it. And the wedding ceremony, at least most of the ceremonies I've gone to and certainly all that I've conducted, some point in the ceremony, I ask them to join their right hands. And then when the church offices are ordained in many denominations, what do we do? We place our hands on them, as they did in the Scriptures. Julie Eisenhower wrote a wonderful little book, not a little book, it's a big book, on interesting people. It's one of the most interesting books I've ever read. And one of the interesting people she wrote about was my wife. And they serialized uh, that chapter in a number of newspapers across the country. Maybe they did here, I don't know. 
but she has the most remarkable description of my wife's hands that I've ever read. And I thought, well, she's captured not only Ruth's life and her spiritual dimension, and you know, Julie was in our home for several days and she never took a note. She must have a tremendous memory because everything in that chapter is almost to perfection about my wife, a little bit about me. She, she got that straight too. <laughs> but in reading the four Gospels, they constitute a picture book of Jesus' hands. And I want you to see the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. First, the creating hand. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul in Colossians said, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, visible and invisible. All the mountains, all the seas, all the stars, all the planets, all the galaxies were made by him. Those hands flung those galaxies into space from flaming fingertips. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus says in this chapter, Behold my hands. He also said it in Luke 24. Behold my hands. The hands that created the world the Lord Jesus Christ's hands. And then secondly, there's the healing hands. We've been talking about people in the city of Cincinnati in this area tonight hurting. People that are in the hospitals that are sick. People that are dying right this minute. People that have been told today that they have terminal cancer. People today. the dean of our college where we live, one of the most wonderful men I've ever known, fell out of a tree today. He's dead tonight. We don't know whether he had a heart attack or what happened yet, or whether he, he broke his back or his neck when he fell. One of our neighbors and one of our friends. Our hands, the healing hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he uses your hands as you minister, the hands of a doctor, the hands of a nurse, the hands of a social worker, the hands of the clergyman, the hands of the psychiatrist or the psychologist to talk to you, to heal you, to help you. But there's the hands of Jesus to heal your heart, to heal your mind, to heal your soul, to heal your body, if he wills. Think of the leper crying, unclean, unclean, unclean. The lepers, no one could go near them, social outcast. Little bells they would ring in those days. Keep away, keep away, I'm a leper. Unclean, unclean. Jesus walked right up to them and put his hand right on the leper. Can you imagine what that meant to that leper? I imagine years had gone by since a human hand had touched him and Jesus touched him. And he was healed. The leprosy was gone. The healing touch of the hand of Jesus. Remember when he went to Peter's home, Peter's mother-in-law was sick nigh unto death. Jesus went in and took her by the hand. She got up and began to wait on the tables. The healing touch of Jesus, the man born blind. Jesus calls him to get a little dust from the earth, collects the saliva and puts it in the dust and makes a little salve and puts it on his eyes with his hands. And he's healed. The touch of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in healing. Has he come into your heart to heal your hurt? The hurt between you and your wife? The hurt between you and your son? The hurt between you and your brother? The hurt between you and your neighbor? The hurt of poverty out of a job? The hurt of 
bad health, whatever it is, let Jesus touch you tonight. He loves you. He wants to help. But he can't help if you keep the door closed. You have to open the door. You see, he's standing there knocking with his hand, as we'll see in a moment. And then thirdly, we've been talking about earlier this evening, the hand of compassion. He said, I have compassion on the multitude because they've now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. So he said, feed them, the hungry people of the world. He has compassion on them. He has compassion on you tonight in your need, in your hurt, in your place, in your suffering. And as he looked out over the city of Jerusalem, he had compassion on that great and magnificent city. He knew that judgment was in store for the city, and it says that he had compassion on them. And he looks over Cincinnati tonight. He looks over Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio, these three great states, and he has compassion. And then fourthly, there's the hand of blessing. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took up the little children, and the scripture says he blessed them. I see little children here tonight. You may have gray hair and you may have a bald head, but in God's sight you're a little child. And Jesus wants to take you in his arms and love you and bless you and change you and make you a new person and make your home a new place and give you hope and purpose and meaning for life if you'll let him, but you have to open the door. But you have to become as a little child. You can't come to Jesus with your shoulders red back and with a lot of pride. You have to get rid of all that pride and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You died for me on the cross and I'm coming to that cross and I want your blessing. I want forgiveness of my sins. Has that happened to you? And then fourthly, there's the suffering hands of Jesus. And this is the thing we will be most impressed with when we see him in heaven because, you see, when we get to heaven, we're going to find that his hands suffered when they drove those nails in and then when they picked him up and hung him between heaven and earth and the terrible jolt that tore his hands and the wound was so great that Thomas could put his own hands in those holes. And Jesus will wear those scars for eternity. And when I look at the cross, I see at least three things. I see sin. The most sinful place in the history of the world is the cross. Jesus became the most sinful man that ever lived. You know why? The scripture says he became sin for us. He had never known sin. All of a sudden, he not only had the sins of the people of that generation, but he had the sins of all mankind, every person that will ever live. He had the sins on him. He became guilty of every single sin. Think of a person that had never sinned and all of a sudden every sin he's guilty of. His suffering was 10,000 times worse than that of the average man who would be crucified. He was suffering spiritually when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The suffering hands of Jesus, I see sin. But I also see something else on the cross. I see the love of God. I, I, can't, ex I can't describe it. There's no way to describe God's love. It's too deep, it's too high, it's too broad. It's too great. The New Testament writers had to invent a new word to describe the love of God. There was no word for love in the whole Greek language that could describe the supernatural love of God, so they invented agape. And if he bore our sins on the cross, then God can still be just and still be the justifier. 
Because if God had just come along and forgiven you without somebody paying the price, he would have been a liar and his moral universe would have blown up and exploded like an atomic bomb. Somebody had to pay the price. Either you or some sinless person that would be acceptable to God and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing I see in the suffering hands is that it's the only way of salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other except through the name of Jesus. You can't be saved by your works. You can't buy your way. It's not for sale. But Christ offers it to you from the cross. It was the blood that was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, the Scripture says. And he shed his blood on that cross for you. And it's the only way. The blood has to be there. Remember the night in Egypt in the Old Testament when the death angel passed over? And those Jewish people had to have the blood sprinkled on the doorpost in order to be saved? The blood had to be there. And so the blood has to be there for God to see, and he sees the blood of Christ that was shed for you. And he passes over when judgment comes. And then there's another thing about the hands of Jesus. What kind of hands? The healing hands, the suffering hands, the nail-scarred hands, but then his knocking hands. In Revelation 3.20, the Scripture says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Knocking at the door of the church. Knocking at the door of your family. Knocking at your door. Why doesn't he just push the door open and come in and save me? He never interferes with your will. You have a will of your own. That's the way he made you. He made you in his image. You can reject him. You can go to your grave rejecting Christ and there's nothing God can do about it. He'll do everything in his power to warn you. He'll do everything in his power to bring incidents across your path to stop you. But he won't trespass on your will. That's something you have to decide. You have to say, I will receive him as my Savior and my Lord. And so your will is involved. You have to invite him. If you don't invite him in, he won't come in. He'll not push the door open. What motivates a person to open the door? Well, I was talking to a person just before I came to Cincinnati about Jesus Christ. We met on the plane. He told me that he'd been converted a few months earlier. And I said, how were you converted? Well, he said, we had a, a child, our only child. She was killed in an automobile wreck. And he said, I knew that I'd been resisting God for a long time. And he said, as I stood there and watched that little casket go down into the grave. I said, Lord Jesus, come in. And you know, I began to realize that God had to take my little child to get me into the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I often wondered at the love of God. He said, even in my tears, I knew. What motivates you? A railroad engineer fell out of the train and it went across his leg and he lost his leg and he said, I was there cut in the darkness. Nobody knew I'd fallen. I lay there bleeding and I felt Jesus knocking at my heart's door and he said, I let him in. He's knocking at your heart's door. Can you hear him? And as you get older, you can barely hear it because your heart gets harder and harder and harder. He that hardens his heart, being often reproved, that means being often with knocking on your door, and you don't do anything about it. God will still speak, but you can't, you can't hear anymore. 
And the Bible teaches that there's a place beyond which you cross over a line. I'm not quite sure where it is and when it is, but it's there. And that's the reason he says, harden not your heart. Listen to the knock. And then sixthly, there's the outstretched hands of the Lord Jesus, stretching his hands for you and saying, Jim, Bill, Susie, Mary, I love you. I died for you. Come. Let me put my arm around you. Let me be your brother. Let me be your husband, your wife. Let me be all that you need in your soul and your heart and your mind. Because you see, it's not just to save you from sin and save you for eternity, but it's to save you right now, to walk with you. He'll free you tonight if you let him, those outstretched hands. Like the master violinist, he will touch you and bring beautiful music out of your life because he's the master and he's knocking on your heart's door tonight with those wonderful hands of his that created the universe. Will you open the door and let him in? You have to open. You may be a member of the church. You may be Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or you may not have any church affiliation. You may not have any religion. I don't know. Or you may be a deacon in the church. You may be singing in the choir. But you know Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. You want to make sure of your relationship to him tonight. You come. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come and stand here in front and say by coming, I want Christ into my heart. I want to open the door and let him in. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to all of you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. If you come from that top balcony, it takes nearly two minutes. So start right now, quickly. Many of you, hundreds of you, you come and let Christ come into your heart and make you a new person right now. Many people are already on the way. You get up and come with them. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
You that are watching by television can already see that hundreds of people are coming here in this beautiful Coliseum in Cincinnati. They're coming to receive Christ. They're opening their heart's door to let him in. You can do the same wherever you are. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Open the door and let him in. Let his hand touch you. He'll forgive you and change you and make you a new person. God help you to make that decision and be sure and go to church on the Lord's Day. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free. So come walk. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel. Now at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the greatest of all the kings, probably, that ever lived. And he conquered Jerusalem, and he takes some Jewish captives among the young men, many of them in their middle or late teens. They were scientifically inclined. He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire. Very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II, they took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him, and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how, intellectually, he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God and that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament and he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men. Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early. Because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. 
Now, Daniel had had a dream, and uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people, and he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer. But they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar and he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet of clay mixed with iron, or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live, and then it will decrease on down till the end of history, and then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image, and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God that all the empires of the world will someday fail, and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high, made of gold. And he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura. And there he says, I want when you hear the trumpet sound and you hear the music play and you see the flags coming in and you see the marching of the soldiers, I want all of you to bow down and worship the image. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up. You see, force, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world, and he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen, but they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III, and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible, because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true 
and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever. The part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They stood stiff like this as ramrods. They wouldn't bow. And of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor. Now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. Or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day, and they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, he that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, if sinners entice thee, consent not. Follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, we're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. Or they could have refused to bow, which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the Scripture. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision. Then, when the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision. Just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight, for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? 
Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drum beat that the world cannot hear, the drum beat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele, uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help. You need prayer. There's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods now worship the golden image which you have set up. They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, Thy will be done. And God says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, Lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, My grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. 
their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed, their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them, and he said, Your God is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace, and then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God, and he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die, dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's mount and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him and he stayed there for you and for me. He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins and when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, he's there. He helps you in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church. You've been baptized. You've been to Sunday school. But you probably don't even know what repentance is. Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely, and it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart, 
my will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe. And the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds. But I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. As you can see, these hundreds responding here, we want you to take time to call that number now on your screen. Counselors are standing by, ready to talk with you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and then call again. Counselors will be there as long as the calls keep coming in. You that have been watching by television can see that many people here in Oklahoma City are coming to make their commitment to Christ. You can make that commitment where you are. Pick up the telephone and call the number on your screen. And if you don't reach someone, keep dialing. They'll answer after a while. May God bless you and help you as you make this commitment. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Time of decision is really the most important part of every crusade service. And it's the most important part of this telecast because right now where you are, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ. Take time to make that telephone call or to write Billy Graham. And the same helps we are giving these tonight who are responding here, we will send to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Frank